Hello and welcome. Well, as a parent, there's no doubt that you want the very best for your children and to give them the life they deserve. And with so many opportunities available for children in this generation, you know, how do you even know where to start and where to put your focus when it comes to providing the best opportunities to help nurture the development of their beautiful little brains? Well, lucky for us, we're joined today by our special guest, uh, Dr. Tessa Grigg, who's here to share her clinical experience on what you can do that is similar simple and cost effective. Uh, she'll also discuss the links between movement, music and nutrition and the growing brain. Now a little bit of um, information about our guests which we are always so so excited to, to speak to and welcome back. But just in case you haven't seen our other chats, uh, Dr. Tessa Grigg is the research and education manager at Toddler Kindy Roo and Jimbaroo, and she's a part-time lecturer at the University of Canterbury, New Zealand, and a teacher and producer of children's music. Now, she has over 20 years experience in the early childhood and education sector and just a wealth of knowledge on this topic. It's great talking with you again. How are you? Great. Thanks, Rachel. Really good. Well, it's just, um, this is a really interesting concept and I'm really excited to be chatting to you about it. Um, and as I was just saying in the introduction, naturally parents want the best for their children, but with so much on, on offer and available these days, I guess it can be a little bit overwhelming just not knowing where to start, um, where and how they should be giving their kids the best start to life. So I'd love to understand from your perspective, you know, what are the core disciplines um, that parents should be focusing on when wanting to assist their child and uh, their brain's development? Yeah, I love this question, Rachel, because whenever anybody asks me anything about this, I can talk about the three things that I think I'm most passionate about and I've spent my entire work, working life focused on. And that basically boils down to moving, getting children to move right from when I was at Teachers College. And I did a course in sensory motor it was really clear to me that movement was the key to children learning. And of course, since then I've read lots that, and there are lots of studies that support that. Um, good nutrition is of course vital and we know that. And then my other passion happens to be music. And so um, of course I see that that plays a really important part in the development of all children, but in particular for young children. Mm. And there's been some really interesting research from Italy and the USA that assesses, um, you know, the, the nurturing of young brains through movement, music and nutrition. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about sort of that research that's just not, not long come out? Yeah, well, what they did was they looked at lots of studies to work out whether there was a correlation between these three things right. and things like increased academic performance or attention span or focus. And they found that definitely there was, that um, when children move, there was evidence, um, studies showed that there was evidence that there were better um, academic outcomes. Um, when the nutrition was improved, they got the same result. And it also seemed that when children had good, strong music experiences, that they um, also noticed could measure an increase in various aspects of academic progress. One of the things they couldn't work out is how it all works or why, but it just seems it does. And I don't know. I mean, obviously, there are people who really want to know why it works and how it works. Of course, for the most, for somebody like me who's a practitioner, I just want something that works. And so as far as I'm concerned, that's all I need. The fact that people, and certainly anecdotally, I know this, that these three things are you know, key to children succeeding. But yeah, it's good to be able to read it, uh, you know, for other people to gather the research and to know that there is actually a scientific basis to what's being said rather than just, you know, somebody's hunch. So this research really just supported what you already knew and already had in practice. Is that right? I couldn't believe when I found the article. No. <laughs> I thought, oh, <laughs> hallelujah, this is fantastic. This it puts my whole life work basically on, onto, I don't know how many pages long it was, 12, 14 pages long. You know, there it all was in black and white. And somebody had gathered all the research that says these things are good for children. 
And so how did you know, I guess, is instinctively just through, through your years of study um, and, and as, as a pr- practitioner yourself, how did you know that um, aside from, you know, obviously the, 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 the research is it's like supporting what you already knew? Um, I think intuitively when I first did that course, I did, when you're at um, college training to be a teacher, they teach you all sorts of things. Yeah. And lots of the courses, I think, oh, yeah, that's interesting or that's fun. But the course, the sensory motor course, like the light bulbs just used to go off in my brain every week. And I just used to go, whoa, this is so exciting. And I don't think back then, because I remember this was a thousand years ago, Rachel, um, I don't remember that um, I totally understood what I, what was really important to me. But over the years, I've worked out, I think the reason why I was so attracted to it is it's what's called a bottom-up approach. So we're not looking at the symptoms of the problem. We're saying, what's actually causing the issue? And we, um, I knew from the college course that we got these extraordinary changes with children with quite severe um, learning disabilities. And my mind, I always go, well, if it works for those children, why can't I just make life better for children who supposedly haven't got learning challenges? And that's, I guess that's always where I've come from, that I want to look behind the issue. I'm not really, in, I mean, I'm interested in the presenting problem. I don't want to put a Band-Aid on that. I want to stop it happening again. And that's why this article was just, you know, and then the music happened. I've seen... Um, I've watched children's response to music and I've watched, um, oh, the loveliest story I had was a little boy with multiple, multiple um, disabilities. He was really quite disabled, but his mum used to bring him to the Jimbaru Kindiru class I ran in New Zealand and he really didn't participate much. And I sometimes used to wonder why she was bringing him, but, you know, I just carried on as if he was participating. And then there was a day where he came and did a partner dance with me. It was so hard. All of the mothers were in tears. We were, mm. everybody was in tears. It was just heartbreaking, but it was so gorgeous that that dance gave him, I don't know, something that he wanted to join in. And it's a, it's a dance where you touch hands to hands. And I mean, it was too cute. Nobody filmed it because that was back in the day where we didn't all have phones with cameras. But um, if it had been today, it would have been filmed. And um, what's really kind of sad was that about two weeks later, he died. But all the parents have this extraordinary memory of this child. Now, that kind of experience is what makes you go, yep, there's definitely something really powerful about music. If it can affect a child like that, then it does the same for other children as well. Of course. So what, um, thank you for sharing that. Um, and what else has been your personal experiences, I guess, of addressing movement, music and nutrition to help develop children's brains? Well, yeah, this I've seen time and time again, particularly when I was running my Jimbaru Kindiru Centre in Christchurch. I had numerous children, too many for me to count now, where they'd arrive at, I don't know, 18 months or two or even younger. Mm -hmm. And I'd look at them and I'd go, ooh, am I going to be able to get you to school? Because they would have some delays or what we'd call just noticeable differences and yeah. so if I could get if I could get the mum on board which I used to try and help you know help them to get them on board I can't all of those children went to school functioning at their age and some of them even at a higher level than their chronological age and I just go yeah this is where it's at, you know, and always the ones that were the best success were where the mum really got in behind what we were doing and they would practice every day and they would make sure that the child had this really rich environment. So I always say, you know, if you've got a child with any kind of issue, all they need is the feisty mother and they'll do really well. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is the million dollars million dollar question and you probably don't want me to ask this but i'll ask it anyway but you know with the three movement music and nutrition uh do you see any one of them being more important than the other well rachel i knew you were going to ask this (laughs) i just sort of could feel it in my bones 
so the dog and I were walking today and the two of us decided that if we had, if she pushes me and makes me make a choice, I probably would put movement and nutrition at the top. Um, and then it would be an upside down triangle. So the movement and nutrition would be at the top and then the music is there supporting those two things really strongly. So if you can get the movement, if you can get those things right, and if you can um, make sure that your children are getting good, solid, strong nutrition, um, and then the music kind of comes along as well, you just you end up with a really good result. Yes. Well, you've mentioned before that we published an article um, and um, the title of that is Jimbaroo Kindiru Nurture Brains, Parents and Partnerships. So for someone who hasn't read the article yet, can you please give us a little bit of an overview and just tell us what inspired you to write it? Yeah. Well, as I've already said, um, I found this article and I put, sort of thought this was the best thing since sliced bread. I just loved what it said. And I thought, yeah, I really want to write to parents about that because essentially it supports what lots of us have known for a long time yes. in a concise way and making it so that it's, it's science-based as well. And the other thing is, I couldn't believe that I found an article that was all about things that I'm just completely passionate about. <laughs> so it was a little bit sort of self-indulgent, really, to be able to write about the, you know, three things I love more than anything. And um, so therefore, and to be able to, some of these articles that get written, they're kind of long-winded and they have a lot of statistics and stuff. And I quite like being able to break them down and go, well, actually, these are the key points that if you're a busy parent, this is what you need to know. One, two, so and three. Here you go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so can you explain, I guess, why movement is so important for um, a, a developing brain? Yeah, Rachel, as you know, I mean, we've got one eyed about this, but um, there's evidence to support that. Um, I think I've talked about her before, Esther Thielen, and yes. she did some quite good research. And she said that, Children get themselves organized, particularly babies, which is where her research was focused. They get themselves organized through movement. And there isn't always just one way that they need to move. They can arrive, you know, they arrive in their own um, little path, however they choose to do it. And she showed that, the, and of course, now we've got MRI functioning to show what happens to brains when there's movement. So children who've been brought up in an orphanage with no touch and no movement, they spend most of their lives in a cot. When their brains are scanned, they look quite different to a child who's had lots of movement experience. So we know that movement um, it correlates with academic achievement, and which isn't really the reason you should be doing it, but um, it's about getting that brain moving to get the connections firing to then enable them to um, the skills that they need to for later on. My husband and I, one of our first dates, and so it was obviously a good thing because, well, I don't know if it was a good thing, but anyway, he was long suffering. We went and listened to an American educational philosophy, and I can't remember her name, which is a bit of a shame, it was a few years ago. And she talked about the fact that with the way the education system was moving, the three things or the two things that she saw as most important were movement and the arts, because those two things get children organized for being able to be creative problem solvers, being able to lateral um, thinking, la absolutely all those good things. And so therefore we're not trying to make children to be able to rote learn that that's gone. That, that died a long time ago. We want these, problem solvers and creative thinkers and people thinking outside the box you know people want to go to mars you've got to think out of the box to get there so in her thing this is 22 years ago um her thing was that we need to focus on the arts which is movement and music and uh, sorry music and painting and all those kind of creative things and movement and she said that's all these children are not all they're going to need, but that's a really important part of what they're going to need. Um, and then we've got other, other things like physical fitness. So when you do good movement activities with young children, you're setting up, you're setting up a pattern for their life. 
And that's what I like about Jimbaru is that we're actually setting patterns for life. And according to my, the article I wrote about, which I didn't write about in what I wrote for um, you, but, you know, it staves off um, dementia and <laughs> Alzheimer's wow. and um, all those kind of neurological issues when people are moving and had good movement um, um, habits then those kind of conditions were less. So movement, it's not just about children. It's a lifelong thing. Of course, you and I are focusing on children, but what you do at that early age is going to set them up good patterns for later on. Yeah. And can you explain um, if there's anything else, I guess, um, why movement and music are linked to the developing brain? Is there anything else that we should know? Um, I think music links in because when children when children are moving um, and they do MRI scans of their brain, the same places light up as when they're doing cognitive tasks. So every time your child does movement things, they're actually exercising their brain quite nicely. What music does is it uses some some of the same parts of the brain, but also some different parts and. I guess music is supposedly more of a right hemisphere activity and definitely musicians' brains look different. They are larger than people, non-musicians' brains. And I don't, yeah, well, the jury's out whether a large brain makes you more intelligent or not. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But it shows that musicians have a different brain. That's a good thing. But life has a beat. Everything you do has a beat. Writing has a beat. Um, any kind of sport you play has a beat. Walking has a beat. Um, even things like chopping vegetables has a beat. And if you can chop things in a rhythm that works for you, or if you can walk in a rhythm, if you're constantly all over the place, it makes it much harder. So um, with young children, I spend all of my time teaching them to keep the beat. And when they can keep the beat, so much of their life changes and it's better. So that's how, you know, and we don't just keep the beat by tapping sticks. We move and, you know, you want the whole body involved. So, yeah, it's, it's fun. Oh, and I guess with the importance of music and, and movement in focus, uh, what part does nutrition, I guess, play in the development of children's brains then? Well, again, the research is really clear that good nutrition makes a huge difference to children. And there have been things like um, omega-3 is well known, folic acid yep. is well known as increasing brain function. Um, but the, uh, over the summer holidays, I had time to do a little bit of reading and everything I read, it didn't, what, the, what it boiled down to was that it didn't actually matter what you ate, as long as it was fresh, and as close to its source natural as source possible. yes yeah so as soon as um you know you start um preserving it and um adding putting additives modifying in, all that, yeah the, yeah the quality of the food goes down and it basically the rules were keep it clean so if you can do clean eating with your child so um lots of fresh fruit vegetables meat if you eat meat whatever and a wide variety then the child's brain is going to have a much better chance of um, uh, developing to its potential and of course um, I think there's lots of um, I think there's research around that says that uh, children with lots of preservative in their brain they sort of have a fog and um, if you talk to families where they've cleaned up their diets the brain the children will say things like oh, reading's so much easier, or I can think more easily, or whatever. So that fog goes away. Um, so, yeah, basically good fuel grows brains. Yes, and I've actually seen some documentaries and um, read some articles also about the benefits for children with learning challenges and also um, on the um, autism spectrum as well, um, that, it, that it helps cool. quite significantly. So, yeah. And so getting back to, I guess, experiences and activities, um, you know, what – 
what examples can you maybe give some parents, um, um, I guess, that they can provide their preschoolers that are quite, you know, simple and cost effective um, to help assist the, the development of their children's brains with regards to activities for, you know, um, that fit into, I guess, you know, movement, music and nutrition. You know, what's, what's your, your thoughts on this? Well, I think you already know, Rachel, we haven't, we've talked about this before. <laughs> I'm a huge supporter of the park. And most people have a park or an open space somewhere close. And yes. when you've got young children, utilize it because that's where they do huge amounts of learning um, movement things. But, you know, also take time to, if they find some ants or something on the ground, you know, have time to look at that and explore it. Explore it, it. Um, yes. I love, yeah, explore I love parks where there are bushes that they can go and hide in and trees they can climb. They're not always as common. Um, anything that you can do, I know that, you know, here in Christchurch, we've got some great parks and I always encourage parents, don't always go to the same park. You know, it's like always thinking broccoli is the best thing and so all you do is eat broccoli and then you've missed out all the other things. You know, you want this really good variety and that happens when it comes to parks and movement experiences as well. Um, I wrote an article not long ago about making your house into a gym, I think we yes, about this. Yes, and, yes, that was a few months you know, ago. So, yeah, so just look for ways to create obstacle courses, particularly if you're in a place where it's cold and you can't go out so much. People have got beaches. I know on the east coast of Australia, you've got some of the best beaches in the world. So, you know, make the most of them. And when it comes to music, yes, I love children going to music classes or I love them um, doing something like Kindiru Jimbaru. But I also really like parents dancing with their children. You know, oh, there's yes. nothing more gorgeous than a good bit of music and some boogieing. And it doesn't, it's not expensive to get a couple of wooden spoons and tap them together to get the beat. Because really for those first few years, you just want the beat. So anything you can do musically, um, sounds, find interesting bits of rubbish or children love the pot cupboard or the drawer, you know, with all the um, plastic things and all that play. sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And that's um, a really good place to start as well. You don't have to do complicated music, but um, that ability to keep the beat, any parent can teach that quite easily. Yes. Thank you for sharing those. And I think at a time now, um, as we've sort of come out of lockdown and, you know, um, a lot of families naturally have been affected what's, what's happened and we still continue to happen with the economy with COVID-19 as well. Um, this is wonderful that all of these things are simple and cost effective. Um, and it's just a, a matter of, I guess, maybe even just continue to do some research online to sort of find all those types of things that parents can do um, without having to go out and spend any money, without having to go into the shops, with things around the house house as you said things that are um just around the corner be at the park or um you know wherever that you live you can sort of take kids out and actually give them an experience um just to help you know move and expand their brains a little bit which is um really important thank you for sharing those um you i know, think rachel the other oh sorry i think the other thing that i didn't say is time and of course hopefully um people can still um, prioritize in lockdown, we all had lots of time and there was plenty of stuff going on. It was really good for children. But now that everybody's getting a bit busier, to just make sure that you prioritise some time with your children and do these things, I think it's really important. Yes. there's um In some of the um, interviews I've been doing recently, there was one particular point somebody raised and um, it was the fact that they made a list of all of the things that they, they loved um, and the experiences from being in lockdown. And uh, there was five in particular that they, both the mum and the dad, um, decided to, to make a list and, and things that they were willing to commit to now that we're out of lockdown and that they want to, to continue doing. Um, and I thought that was a really powerful thing to do because it was a, a very uh, once in a generation experience that we had in lockdown. Um, and for all of the wonderful benefits of having us slow down with the stay at home era, it, it definitely did teach us a lot. So it's a matter of yeah. understanding and knowing what worked for you and your family and what you want to continue doing. And then just making that commitment, I think, um, and having the discipline to make sure that you just keep doing it because you can have the best of both worlds, which is, um, yeah. which is, <laughs> which is just wonderful. Um, 
Yeah. Now, now you, you shared a beautiful story at the start of this chat. Um, and I'd love to ask you, have you actually seen any other results um, of addressing one or more of these things being movement, music and nutrition, uh, in particular um, with children that have sort of um, learning challenges? Is there anything else that you've, any other? Um, yeah, well, as I said before, I've seen lots of these children. I remember, um, well, I've actually got a little boy at the moment um, that he comes to my music class and his mum has been doing a movement program with him and she does music and she's really fussy about his diet. Well, she has to be. She has been given a choice. What you said about um, ADD, ADHD um, and those kind of issues. He's a classic example um, where his food really makes a difference to him. But he is now, so when I first met him, he was about uh, 18 months old and he was quite developmentally quite delayed, really, um, yeah, quite delayed. I was really concerned about him. And so I said to the mum, you know, you and I, we're gonna get together and we're gonna change this trajectory for this child. And she's been amazing, and that always makes a huge difference. But he's now four and a bit, and his language is gorgeous. His physical skills are getting there. They're very Wonderful. close. He's probably not quite at his age yet, but he's getting there. And he will um, probably not go to school at five, but he'll go to school, I would imagine, at five and a half. And he will do fine. He's just doing fine because cognitively he's fine. It's just some of his physical, physical challenges have been quite extreme. But anyway, he's, and, and I've seen that happen um, with many children where, you know, I, I think sometimes the parents, particularly if it's their first child, they don't notice how big the differences are. And they also might not notice that, um, you know, what the future is going to be like because they don't know any different. But when you're working with um, a, an experienced teacher, and this is what we train, we train all our Jimbury Kinderu teachers to recognize these differences and to get beside the parent and help them to move. So it's, it's I wouldn't say it's a common experience at um, Jimbury Kinderu, but it happens quite a lot. Yeah, we see it quite a lot. And as soon as um, you get beside parents, then it, it can make a huge difference. Yeah, huge. And, um... And having read the article as well, you mentioned one of the first few paragraphs that the experiences that we give children appear to be the basis of their brain's development. So in your opinion, you know, why do you think it's so important um, that parents provide, I guess, a wide range of different experiences for, for children um, and to help their brain's development? Yeah, well, the way we've got our society, children have to be able to fit into multiple things. And that's tricky for parents who've got a child who's just obsessed about one thing. And quite often you'll get a toddler and all they like are cars and wheels or yep, all yep. they like is something, you know, they, they choose something that they're quite obsessed about. It might be books, you know, they're just obsessed about books and they just want to read all day. <laughs> but as a parent, I think it's really important because you don't actually know where they're going to go and it's quite a few years away before they start making decisions about what they're interested in that it's really important to have what I call a well-rounded child so that they can dabble in everything and then as they get older they will find the things that they like best um, I don't know how well you know um, Hayley Westerner, but she was a singer in New Zealand who was very young and she hit the world stage and she, you know, sold masses and masses of uh, records. And I read her biography, which is quite interesting when it's been written about a 16-year-old because there wasn't that much to write. But one of the things that I did get from it, which I thought was really, really valuable, was the fact that her mum had let those children try everything. And she had encouraged them to try everything, even though they were clearly quite, all of, the, all of her children are quite musically able, she encouraged them to do sport. She encouraged them to try things, you know, all the things, Taekwondo, the whole lot, they tried all sorts of things. And I think that's really important as a parent that you put out, it's sort of like a smorgasbord. You put the whole lot out in front of the child and you go, let's try all these things. And then when you're a bit older, you'll be able to choose the things you like best. 
Yeah, I, I think it's, it's um, and, and what an opportunity in this day and age for, for parents to be able to do that too, because there is so much available, as we we're saying at the start of the chat yeah. also. Um, and another thing you mentioned in the article also is that the physical structure of the brain changes right throughout our lives, as you've just mentioned just now as well. Um, so to be able to at least give as many opportunities at, at a young age um, makes a lot of sense. Um, but I guess the physical structure um, sort of is, is a result of the experiences and the environment that we live in. Now, as a question, does this actually mean that children that um, either have less experiences or maybe, let's say, from um, a lower socioeconomic um, you know, background are less likely to have their brains develop? Or, or, or I should rephrase that, sorry, maybe are less li li likely to have their brains develop in a different way than a child that has had more experiences um, as a general question, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, well, the sad reality is that sometimes children who come from low socioeconomic backgrounds, their parents are very stressed, they're time poor, they, um, they don't have lots of resources to be able to help them provide good experiences, and they may also not have had um, as much educational opportunities as other parents. However, that is not a reason for a, a, a lack of funds, um, monetary funds, what I'm talking about, it's not a reason for children's brains not to grow. If parents know what they're doing and know how to invest in their children's future, then it doesn't matter where your socioeconomic background is. I've seen examples where children have come from quite a low socioeconomic background and they've ended up doing really, really well at university. And if you talk to them, they will always say, my mum got right beside me and encouraged me and provided all these fabulous opportunities for me. And yes, as they get older, things cost. Teenagers cost a fortune. But when they're young, you can put that groundwork in for very little cost, very little cost. Most um, communities have libraries that you can utilise. There's a lot of free stuff for preschoolers. And I encourage people to use that kind of stuff. And then things like um, Jimbaroo Kindiru, I've often suggested that, you know, you might like to ask grandparents to give that as a present. As a present, you know, yeah. So that, yeah, it's a, it's a great present rather than plastic things, although books are a good present too. But, you know, that's, a, that's another good option if um, that's hard. But I think that, um, yes, children, but then you can have children from very, I mean, I remember teaching in a, um, a, a preschool in New Zealand, so it's not an Australian one, but in New Zealand, and these families were, you know, in the top income earners. And when I was asked to do it, I was thinking, really? You're not going to need this. Why do you want me to come and do this? And anyway, but they were paying me, so off I trotted with all my stuff and got their children to jump. And I was absolutely staggered at what these children couldn't do. So these are very children from very privileged backgrounds, but their parents were also time poor. And so they hadn't had, there were children who were three and a half who couldn't jump, you know, and that's not through ability, that was just through experience. They didn't have a parent who either knew what they were supposed to be doing or had the time. So I'm not totally convinced that it's totally, um, it's, it's a lot to do with what the parent knows and what to focus on. And if the parent knows what to focus on, which is why these kind of interviews are lovely, because anyone can listen to this. You don't well, have to. That's the whole reason, you know, the yeah. Kittypedia was created, is, was to be able to, to deliver expert information and advice from people yeah. like yourself, that anyone um, and any Australian um, family and or that anyone overseas uh, with young children can have access to top tier quality information, um, irrespective yeah. of what their socioeconomic um, demographic is. And that's the whole thing. So, and I, I truly believe that some of the great minds of our time haven't necessarily been um, through private school schooling and everything else as well it really just as you just alluded to earlier it just depends on the dedication that the family um the parents and the children have um the commitment that they have to wanting to sort of you know improve their life and create a better future for themselves um by just um you know i guess having just just that hunger for for knowledge and information because it's all out there and um it's what it takes 
Yeah. Well, this has been a really great chat as always. Love chatting with you. But if you were to, I guess, summarize, I guess, your key messages um, for anyone watching and listening um, on this topic today, what would they be? Well, as a paraphrase, don't just eat broccoli. So um, make sure that you cover a good range of things. Today, I've focused on music and movement and nutrition, but you could also talk to somebody else who said there were other important things. But for me, these are the three most important things and also things that seem to have a good basis for investing time in them. And you can spend some money on these things, but you can also do a lot of them yourselves. And yes. um, I think that's a really important message as well. And uh, if parents have um, any other questions for you, um, of course, we're going to have the link to your article in the show notes, um, which also has a link through to um, that research that we were talking about earlier from Italy and uh, the USA. But if they've got any specific questions for you or, and or want to learn more about uh, Jimbaru and Kindiru, whereabouts can they find you guys? Well, um, jimbaru.com com.au is the website or if you just type in Jimbaru that will get to it'll pop there. up and yep. they can email me directly at tessa.grigg g-r-i-g-g at jimbaru.com.au and I'm more than happy to answer questions I'm good at replying to my emails Rachel so <laughs> I, um, you are. I welcome I yeah I, I try really hard yeah no no you're good too but I try really hard because I think when parents are showing an interest, it's really important to get back to them. So I welcome anybody emailing me anytime. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I can't wait to chat the next time. The next time. Take care. See you later. You too. Bye, Rachel. Thanks. Bye.